We are delighted today to have Jennifer Rothman with us from Loyola Law School in Los Angeles to talk about her new book, uh, The Right of Publicity. I'm Jessica Field. I'm the Acting Assistant Director of the Cyber Law Clinic here. Um, and this topic is especially interesting to us because it's one that comes up a lot as we advise clients um, thinking about this essential question of the book, uh, who controls how one's identity is used by others. Um, and uh, we're excited to hear Professor Rothman's perspective um, on how this is becoming relevant um, for so many private individuals in addition to the celebrities that the law was often, um, these state laws were often originally contemplated in relation to. Um, so please join me in welcoming um, Jennifer Rothman and we'll have our own um, Professor Tushnet in conversation with her at the end. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to the Berkman Klein Center for inviting me to talk about my book and for Rebecca Tushnet, who read uh, a very early draft and gave some comments and then is going to participate in some of the conversation afterwards. And Carrie Anderson, who I think couldn't be here today, but helped organize uh, my trip in, in many different ways. Um, the book is titled The Right of Publicity, Privacy Reimagined for a Public World. And I thought it wasn't, we weren't going to have copies for a few weeks, but the, because it's Harvard University Press, they were able to get some copies for us here. Uh, so if you want to hear more about it or read more about it, you can pick up a copy at the end. Um, the book challenges the conventional yet erroneous story of the right of publicity's development. And by doing so, provides a number of insights for resolving some of the problems posed by today's right of publicity including its conflict with individual liberty, free speech, and the rights afforded by copyright law. Some people in the room may be more familiar with the right of publicity than others, um, but at its essence, the right of publicity is something we all have. It's the right to stop others from using our identities, particularly our names and likenesses without permission, and usually for a defendant's advantage. It sometimes is thought of as a property right in one's personality. I contend in the book that the right of publicity lost its way when it shifted from something rooted in the individual, whether understood as a property right or not, to an intellectual property or quasi IP right that could be taken away and transferred to others. This shift has not only jeopardized our control over our own identities, a central concern in the book, but the shift to the intellectual property frame has also dangerously expanded the right in ways that limit and interfere with creative expression and even with news reporting. Today, little remains unspoken, secret, or truly private. And the differences between public and private figures and public and private spaces has deteriorated beyond recognition. It's therefore often said that privacy is dead. But privacy lives on in the right of publicity and provides an opportunity to protect privacy in our now very public world. The right of publicity could enable us to stop Facebook from using our names and likenesses to sell Coca-Cola, from uh, stop Twitter from selling playing cards with our names and likenesses on them, mugshot sites from extorting money from those who've been arrested and uh, who want to get their pictures taken down from those sites, as well as provide an avenue for victims of revenge porn and deep fakes to get their images taken off the internet, as well as to recover damages. And in case you thought any of those were imagined, those, each of those examples is happening today. All of those uses of both private and public figures' names and faces have been made, including the Twitter trading cards, if you haven't seen them. Uh, and the right of publicity could uh, provide relief where the today's version of the right of privacy has failed to do so. But in order to allow the right of publicity to do that work without shutting down speech about public figures and public matters and creative expression, and without endangering our ability to control our own identities, we need to reclaim some of the core insights of privacy law and its harmony rather than its differences with the right of publicity. The wrong turns by the right of publicity have been driven and continued by a host of mythologies that have sprung up surrounding both it and its alleged split with its predecessor, the right of privacy. 
And in the book, I challenge these common, though erroneous, stories about the two rights, and by doing so, provide a path for setting the right of publicity back on course again. The first part of the book busts some of these nearly universal myths about the right of publicity and its origins. Now, you did a lot of archival research uh, for the book to tell the true story of how the right of publicity emerged. It's commonly said that the right of publicity is the reverse side of the coin of privacy law. In other words, it's opposite. We commonly hear that privacy protects seclusion, secrecy, and hurt feelings, while publicity primarily protects, sometimes people think exclusively, protects celebrities and their economic interests. But these claims are not true. The primary and main difference with privacy laws is that the right of publicity would eventually become to be understood as transferable, something that could be taken away from the underlying individual. And this transferability, rather than being something that helped individuals, worked to the advantage of corporations and other third parties, and even empowers these entities today to take ownership of our own identities against our wishes. To understand why the shift to today's version of the right of publicity did not happen for the reasons that are so often claimed. Often it's said that the right of publicity is about protecting individuals. One needs to take a little walk down memory lane, and we'll do a brief one here together, uh, and then there's more uh, in the book about this. But I had to go back to primary sources because very early on, these myths about privacy law got repeated and repeated by uh, student authors, professors, by courts and others, often for strategic reasons, um, and have not largely been questioned. So it's almost universally claimed that the right of publicity was created and coined in a Second Circuit Court of Appeals decision in 1953 called Halen Labs v. Topps Chewing Gum. But as the book demonstrates, this turns out to be not true. It didn't coin the term at all, and it didn't create the concept either. The original right of publicity was actually the right of privacy. And at its origin, the right to privacy was primarily about the right to control, quote, publicity about individuals, when and how one's image and name in particular could be used by others in public. The term right of publicity was even used at the time, starting in the mid to late 1800s. And the right of privacy was frequently defined as the right to stop unwarranted publicity about oneself. The very first cases to consider whether there was a right of privacy in the United States were ones that today we would consider to be prototypical right of publicity cases uh, involving the use of a person's name or likeness in an advertisement. Um, up on the screen here are some cases for those who know a little bit about the history of the right of publicity that you may be familiar with. On the left is an image from the Roberson v. Rochester Folding Box Company case from New York. And this is a photograph of Abigail Roberson that was put on advertisements for flour. On the right uh, is an advertisement for New England life insurance. And the man on the left is Paolo Pavisic, who sued when his photograph was used without his permission in the life insurance ad. And that is a, a case that went to the Georgia Supreme Court. So at the time where the right of publicity developed, it was not cases about the publication of private facts or intrusion into seclusion that predominated the adoption of right, uh, the right of privacy, but it was in fact these uses of people's names and likenesses often in commercial contexts. While today the right of privacy means many things jumbled up together for us, from privacy torts to information and data privacy to constitutional privacy focused on decisional autonomy, at its origin in the mid to late 1800s, privacy was expressly located in tort law and was focused primarily on providing a way to control the use of one's names and likeness, the very same interests protected by today's right of publicity laws. And these concerns reached a fever pitch in the mid to late 1800s because of a number of technological changes, just as we find ourselves faced with technological changes in our internet age today. Um, some of these changes, most of these changes were brought about by the Industrial Revolution, including the development of national and international markets, which gave rise to mass media and celebrities across the country and across the world, which made individuals' commercial identities more valuable. It also led to a proliferation of newspapers and advertising and competition for new uh, selling of those newspapers, which led to the rise of yellow journalism and some salacious reporting, which caused some outrage, uh, as well 
as significantly the use of portable cameras that could be operated by amateurs outside of a studio. This is an ad from that era of the 1800s of the Kodak camera, which was one of the first uh, portable cameras. The advertisements touted uh, the features of these, what were called detective cameras, because they could take pictures of people without them being known that we were being taken. Uh, this deceptive angle camera was uh, sold at the time. Uh, and people uh, became very concerned about these unwanted photographs being taken and then disseminated, whether in advertisements or in newspapers. And so the right of privacy was primarily developed to address these concerns. Afterwards, some myths would arise, and you may have heard many of these, that the right of privacy didn't protect public figures, that it didn't provide economic recoveries, that it didn't recognize damages to professional careers or property rights. But none of that was actually true. Privacy did publicity's work from the very beginning. So starting in the 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, public figures had claims, whether they were performers on the stage, actors, singers. Uh, Marion Manola is on the left. Uh, third in is Charles Eliot, former president of Harvard, who was able to bring a successful privacy claim. And on the right, uh, going forward, we have Fred Astaire. So early on, under privacy laws, they were able to bring claims. These were not just emotional and dignitary claims. They were able to bring both dignitary and property-based injuries. There were endorsements and public celebrities starting at least in the 1800s, probably going back many centuries before that, who filed privacy lawsuits claiming professional damages, lost endorsement fees, and the like. And they were able to uh, recover economic damages as well, both for their professional careers and personal damages. So what was actually missing? So what was missing from the right of privacy? And what was missing was this transferability of the right. Uniformly, courts said you couldn't transfer the right over your own name and likeness to someone else. Well, this was something that actually was beneficial to individuals, but corporations and companies found this less wonderful because they wanted to be able to control valuable individuals' identities. Um, and so Hollywood and Broadway started to see an opportunity as well as merchandisers. Hey, if we could own these people's identities, think of how much more control we could have. Which brings us to the case that's often credited with creating and coining the right of publicity, but which did not do so, Halen Labs. Now, I went back into the archives and looked at pieces of rotting gum as well as court filings um, in the case. And there's a whole chapter in the book about this case. So I, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it today, except that I think it's very evocative, the facts of the case, and highlighting why this transferability mattered to companies, but not so much to individuals. So if you uh, go into the, the book chapter, you'll see that this case actually wasn't about publicity or privacy rights at all. It was very much a contract case. But here, what the, was at issue were competing baseball cards sold with chewing gum. And of course, the, the baseball cards were really to sell the chewing gum. The baseball players gave permission for the uses of their names and likenesses to two competing companies. And the companies understood that under privacy laws at the time, they needed to get permission from the baseball players to do so and pay them for doing so, and they did. But one company, the one who thought it got the deal first, wanted to stop the other company from using the player's name and likeness, even though the players had agreed to both uses. And through a lot of twists and turns that I don't have time to go into now, uh, uh, the company wound up, by the end of the day, raising the issue in the Second Circuit of whether there had been a transfer of the right of publicity to the company Halen Labs, or really its predecessor, by the baseball player. And once they owned the player, then they could stop the player from giving permission to a second party. And this aspect of the case is what the Hollywood lawyers loved. They were like, wow, the studio system's fallen apart, but if we could own the rights to the name and likeness over our stable of actors, we could stop them from double booking movies, double booking advertisements. We could decide what they could do and what they couldn't do. So we'll just pause there in the, the sort of the history of right of publicity. So as I said, this case didn't actually create the right of publicity. It was decided under New York law, which expressly rejected an independent right of publicity. 
So fast forward about 25 years to 1977, and that is where today's right of publicity truly emerged with a case that went to the Supreme Court, Zucchini v. Scripps Howard. And this is a point in which the right of publicity and the right of privacy truly split, and the right of publicity became understood as an intellectual property right, this IP turn, which largely began in the 1977 Supreme Court case, Zucchini v. Scripps Howard Broadcasting. So in this case, a very unusual set of circumstances, and again, I went into the archives here, I read all the justices' papers, bizarre story of how this unlikely case actually got heard. Every single clerk uh, at the time on the Supreme Court recommended against granting cert in the case, every single one. So um, yet it was heard, uh, and in a 5-4 decision, which is the part I'm gonna focus on in today's uh, talk, a 5-4 decision, the five of the justices worried that uh, that in this case, which involved a human cannonball performance, and the news showed the broadcast of the performance. It was only 15 seconds, but it was, it was perceived to be the entire human cannonball performance. Five of the justices worried that if the news could benefit from a First Amendment defense in this instance, then the news could show any performance, including a symphony that one of the justices just happened to see the night before oral arguments in the case, uh, and was concerned that you, the news could just record the entire symphony or an entire play or a boxing match and broadcast it and say it's news. Uh, and so that really was what was informing the case. And this sort of quasi-copyright case in which copyright didn't apply to the human cannonball performance, but it really was very much like a copyright issue in terms of the performance, led the justices to treat the right of publicity as an intellectual property-like right. This was particularly strange since the case was brought under Ohio's privacy law. Yet the Supreme Court spent much time saying, this is not about privacy, this is about something different, this is about the right of publicity, this is a right that is just like copyrights or patents and justified with all the same reasons, whether it's the incentive rationale encouraging performances or uh, the labor reward of rewarding our human cannonballs efforts in creating uh, their performance. And as I talk about in the book, those justifications don't actually map on very well to the right of publicity, and certainly not outside these performance cases. So, uh, and, and, and as I said, I go into more detail in the book about that. But what I want to highlight here is because of the bizarre facts of this case and the way the Supreme Court described the right of publicity, it became understood as being like copyrights and patents, which are transferable and are forms of intellectual property. And at the same time as this case was decided, Elvis Presley died the same summer, which is a big deal. I'm not a huge Elvis fan, but, uh, but it was a big deal, uh, and he's now one of the most valuable dead people uh, in the world. Um, and his, uh, for those who don't know that much about Elvis, his manager during his lifetime took 80% of Elvis's earnings, Colonel Parker, 80% of his earnings. And when Elvis died, uh, Colonel Parker didn't want to lose his gravy train. And a transferable right of publicity would be very valuable to him because it could survive death, unlike the right of privacy, which would die with the individual and could be transferred to his heirs. So Colonel Parker started litigating all over the country, along with some other heirs to celebrities, um, to try to get these rights to survive death and, and continue earning income. And Zucchini gave them lots of ideas and sort of a, a hook to hang their coat on in that regard. So that sort of sets up where we are today, and that is the true origin of the right of publicity and sort of the sort of misstep in the zucchini in which it was intellectual propertified, uh, which gave opportunities to heirs and celebrities. And this has set up three major problems with today's right of publicity that have created a host of challenges and are obstructing, I think, some of the beneficial insights that the right of publicity could be offering to us today. So in my remaining few minutes of my initial comments, and then we'll open it up for a conversation with Professor Tushnet and, and for your questions, I want to highlight three dangers that today's right of publicity poses. Each of them has its own chapter in the book. So today I'm just going to highlight the challenges rather than providing the solutions, although I talk about some of those solutions uh, more in the book. 
So the first, as I've highlighted here today, is the danger of transferability, that we've created this bizarre world in which our names and likenesses could be owned by someone other than ourselves, and perhaps unwittingly, next time Facebook changes its terms of service, uh, perhaps owned by Facebook. Um, and then they can sell our data and our name and likeness to whoever they want, whether it's Cambridge Analytica or someone else. So if the right of publicity is truly treated as a freely transferable right, like patents and copyrights. That's exactly what should happen. And most states who've adopted right of publicity laws recently have highlighted this free transferability as a feature rather than a, a significant downside to the rights. One lawsuit uh, arose in California involving O.J. Simpson and the estate of Ron Goldman. Some of you may recall that after O.J. Simpson was a famous football player, he was a famous alleged murderer, and although he was acquitted of his criminal charges in the, the death of his ex-wife Nicole Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman, he was held liable in a wrongful death civil suit. And there's a multi-million dollar judgment that issued against him. He then left the state of California for Florida where you can shelter all of your income in a single family home, which is exactly what he did. And he vowed not to give the Goldmans a cent. The Goldmans now were creditors of O.J. Simpson and filed suit to have his intellectual property transferred to the Goldman family. And in fact, that's what happened with regard to the copyright in O.J.'s book, If I Did It. And you'll notice that they released it, the Goldman family, to highlight the I and the if has become very small. Uh, and they also added an introduction, he did it. Uh, because they own the copyright, they could do that. Uh, and uh, they also sought to have his right of publicity transferred to them in which they could then stop him from doing public appearances and perhaps also force his name and image to appear in a variety of ways. A California trial court denied the transfer of the right of publicity saying this would be akin to involuntary servitude. Um, but most courts and uh, lawmakers have said that it is in fact freely transferable. Well, what does it mean if it's freely transferable? Not only could creditors like the Goldmans get, uh, get the rights to a person's name and likeness, or if you declare bankruptcy, your creditors could, your ex-spouses could, but even so-called voluntary transfers may also be troubling. Reality television shows have contestants sign away their rights of publicity to them. Uh, Facebook hasn't thus far reached so far, but has had you sign over the rights to individual uses of your name and likeness and can use you to advertise. Uh, and just read those terms of service. Uh, they change all the time. You've given them permission to do that. The NCAA has claimed that student athletes have assigned to it uh, the rights of the names and likenesses of student athletes in perpetuity in any context, not just uh, in the NCAA context. And parents can also assign away in perpetuity the rights to the names and likenesses of their children that the children cannot get back uh, when they reach the age of 18 uh, and even after death could be owned by someone else. Uh, so uh, it's not entirely clear what someone who owns the rights to your names and likeness could do or stop you from doing. I give an example of the book of Ariana Grande. Suppose when she's starting out, she signed with a manager who's going to help her get her first break. The manager, as a condition of representation, asks her to assign her right of publicity to him. Uh, could he then, and Ariana Grande is a very devout vegan, uh, could he stop her from doing uh, endorsements or be a spokesperson for PETA, an animal rights group? or uh, supporting or doing advertising for tofu, could he force her to advertise uh, lunch meat, which she would find anathema? Now, there's some other laws in this space uh, and that uh, Professor Chesnut certainly teaches about, as do I, in trademark law and advertising law that would provide some limits, but it's not clear how many if they're the actual owners of her right of publicity. So that's one major concern that people rarely talk about is this transferability concern. The second one that I will, I will flag before, before we move on to our conversation is the increasing conflict between the First Amendment and the right of publicity. When the right of publicity became understood as this IP right, not only did it expand in scope because of the misconception, which is true in other areas of IP, that more is usually better, 
Um, but it also then fit into a category of speech that I dub being the beneficiary of an IP exception to the First Amendment, which seems to get less scrutiny uh, when put up against free speech interests. And we've seen this in a variety of contexts. Uh, just last week, this case uh, was uh, overturned on appeal, but a trial court had previously held that effects could not have a character based on the two-time Academy Award winner Olivia de Havilland in its miniseries feud about the feud between Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. Uh, your own Professor Tushnet and I filed uh, an amicus brief in the case and actually got to argue it, the case before the California Court of Appeals a couple weeks ago. Some of the arguments from the, the book and our brief, I think, were persuasive to the court because the trial court had said there's no First Amendment protection here against her right of publicity claim. And the California Court of Appeals got some sense and said, no, that, that can't be right. We have to be able to tell real stories uh, about real people, at least in the movies. But there have been a number of video game cases that have gone the other direction, suggesting that we can't depict real athletes on real rosters, that this is not a violation of the First Amendment, which should be very troubling in a variety of ways, because false endorsement law and defamation law have very robust speech protections that the right of publicity seems to lack entirely. The last major problem I see with the right of publicity, the way the right of publicity is currently treated and the IP turn is its collision with copyright law, federal copyright law. Because the right of publicity has been put on the IP pedestal, it's being seen as equivalent or on par with copyright law rather than the federal law being superior, which causes a number of clashes. Here's one between sort of the actors and producers of the famous sitcom Cheers and the actors. Uh, the actors who are on the right, uh, John Rassenberger and George Wendt, object objected to the use of these robots in Cheers-themed bars uh, at airports that had been licensed by the copyright holders and prevailed uh, in their right of publicity claim and the copyright uh, rights to license were rejected. A more recent case that we might want to talk more about in the Q&A involves uh, the NCAA licensing and selling of photographs in Maloney, in T3V Maloney. And in that case, the Ninth Circuit said federal copyright law prevails here. They can sell these photographs. Um, and so that sounds like a good decision, except then they said, but not on a mug. Not on a mug. You can sell the photograph, but not on a mug. Um, and that makes no sense, because copyright tells us that the selling and reproduction of this photograph is the same as selling the photograph on a mug. The First Amendment says this isn't commercial speech. This can be art on a mug, on a t-shirt. Doesn't matter where it is. And so they shouldn't really be treated differently. And so these are some of the things that I tease out more in the book. So in the years ahead, if we can solve these three major problems, and and understand and better contextualize the right of publicity, the right of publicity should be a tool to protect not only public figures, but private ones as well. And I think that's as it should be. But first, we need to tame the bloated monster that the right of publicity has become, something that the book provides guidance for how to do. Properly understood and cabined, the right of publicity can provide a path to addressing a number of 21st century challenges and for saving privacy itself in our internet age. With that, I'll pause. And... So I think I'm going to take the moderator's privilege to just ask. I'll give you this microphone, okay? but just, just so people know, this is being recorded and webcast since we're talking about privacy. So um, can you sketch the affirmative case for having a right other than a rights against uh, defamation and false light? and a right against false endorsement. Uh, that is, you know, why doesn't that cover the, the, the ground that is worthy of being covered? That is a great question. And so, and I think it's useful, you know, given the, the variety of, I think, attendees here to, to say that there's a, a spectrum of views about the right of publicity. And so while I am very critical of some aspects of the right of publicity, I think it has some important value. And, and I think Professor Toshet and a few others might, to, on the other side, say, maybe let's just get rid of the whole thing. Uh, and, uh, but then there's the vast majority of people who are over here from both of us who think it should be more expansive and more powerful. So I'll just, I'll just to contextualize what this, this question 
uh, to situate the question. So I thought very much about that question as I was working on this book. And I do think that beyond just defamation, right, someone could use uh, an image of someone in ways um, that we might think of whether it's revenge porn or um, you know, Facebook using you in some way to say, oh, you like Coca-Cola because you pressed like on the thing. That's not defamatory. Um, now, it, in some instances, it might raise to the level of false endorsement, but you might be able to say not specifically endorsed. We just want you to know that your friend also likes Coca-Cola because uh, she pressed the like button. And there are instances like that where I think just being able to control the use of your name and like list beyond uh, defamation and false endorsement makes sense. And I think it should be much narrower. The right of publicity has become so expansive that even when you're not using the person's name or likeness but merely evoking them, there can be a liability. And that's a place where I think that, that should not be allowed unless it rises to the level of being defamatory or false, uh, a false endorsement. But I think there's another space where the right of publicity could be doing more work. And I think primarily in the instance of private figures, uh, more so than public figures who are more likely to benefit from false endorsement claims, uh, which private, some people think private figures wouldn't even be able to benefit from because they don't have a commercial, uh, an economically commercially valuable identity. Right. So let me press on that, So, uh, uh, which is uh, so the one thing that you seem to have mentioned so far is the Facebook-like thing. Uh, so does, uh, does that mean that you should have an unwaivable right uh, to... to Frame it one way. Um, you know, the tech companies are, 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 uh, will take this as saying, you have no right to have a business model that relies on saying, I will give you this service for free um, if you give me your data. Um, why, why don't they have the right to have that business model? So I think that the, some of this has to do with the default and also the scope of what can be transferred with the right of publicity. So I don't think that we should obstruct that business model necessarily, but I think that most people who use Facebook have no idea about that, and hidden terms of service that people are agreeing to, and this, some of this has to do with contract law, and, and what should be permissible in terms of what you've agreed to. But I think most people don't realize that. And so I think the defaults should be shifted. And this is, in part, a larger question about information privacy and what our privacy defaults should be. So, but I think it should be much more transparent. And I don't think that any contract should allow a global transfer of one's right of publicity in perpetuity. So I'm less concerned about small waivers in the context of being able to um, use a person's name in the context of a product for a limited period of time, say one year, in a particular context of toothpaste. Um, but the global transfer forever of a person's name and likeness is far more concerning to me in that context. But I guess my question is why? Sorry, one, one last pressing on this. And, uh, uh, because uh, for all the stuff that creeps us out, uh, a five-year transfer is more than enough to get us Cambridge Analytica, right? And and uh, so and there's also plenty of good evidence that uh, companies with an incentive at doing so are really good at get flipping the defaults, right? The, this is uh, Lauren Willis has some excellent work on this. So uh, if if it's a right, it, if it is a problem, the, I, I'm I'm struggling to identify the the source of the the interest that, that can ad adequately be identified by calling it a right of publicity or even a privacy right. Right. So I, I, this is something that I talk about in more depth in the book, is to go through some of the justifications for the right of publicity and right of privacy. And I think the best justifications for the right of publicity are the same ones that justify the right of privacy, which are not about the economic value of the underlying individual, which I think are better addressed through other mechanisms, uh, including false endorsement and trademark law, but are about the dignitary rights and harms that can flow from losing control over your name and likeness and other conditions of identity and letting people use it. In terms of some of the contemporary problems, I think that the right of publicity is one tool of many that could address it. Is it the most efficient way? Probably with some of the Facebook and data breach problems, the best thing is to have government regulation in that space. Um, but I think having an understanding that we have as a default, the self-ownership over our identity is an important starting point on which to base many of these other actions. 
Oh, okay. You mentioned that in one of these cases, I think it was the Santa Monica court rejected a claim on the basis of involuntary servitude. Uh, is that something that I'm sort of trying to understand how that happened and whether that's more broadly applicable than that must be the case? Well, it's off I, a lot of the cases actually going back to the 1800s talk about the loss of control over your own name and likeness as akin to slavery or involuntary servitude. So it's definitely a consistent theme. Um, but as the right of publicity laws are increasingly being passed by statute, they're repeatedly saying that they're freely transferable. Um, and often this is being uh, furthered by two entities today, the Screen Actors Guild, which seems sort of quizzical because it seems against the interests of most of their members but may have some tax advantages for some of their, their biggest earners. And the other is by a company called CMG, which owns dead people um, and uh, very much want uh, the default to be free transferability for their, their economic benefit. Sorry. You said there was a case in particular, like, let's say I was 17 years old and my parents transferred in perpetuity my, my right away. That strikes me that it does fall into involuntary servitude because, well, I didn't actually consent to that and it doesn't seem to be revocable. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. So, I, I mean, my hope is that courts would be able to strike down many of these transfers on, on liberty grounds or right of liberty grounds. But, um, but the rights say they're freely transferable and so... Um, I think there's a real danger that that could happen, and we've seen it in the context. I give an example in, in the book about Martin Luther King Jr. and, and this notion that, he, that his I Have a Dream speech used to be this paradigmatic example of something that everybody would be able to repeat and retell, in fact, in, some, in one amicus brief in the Zucchini case, that that was something that the news should be able to broadcast and transcribe. And then now, today, his estate is able to stop the selling of Martin Luther King Jr. busts and the a sharing of the I Have a Dream speech. So I think uh, what seems like something that would never happen, slowly and incrementally, we can see these sea changes, and, and that's why I think the transferability piece is so dangerous. We have another question. Um, I'd like to ask how likely you think, I'd like to ask how likely you think it is that what you're suggesting will happen, given that we have seen an enormous increase in patent law, copyright, database ownership, all forms of intellectual property seem to be moving overwhelmingly toward more corporate control. How do you see this actually happening, that we could restrict this and get privacy back, perhaps? I'm actually somewhat optimistic uh, in, in part because of this, this project. I think there's not been a lot of voices on the other side of the expansion of the right of publicity. And I don't think there's been a lot of sophisticated understanding about the history or development of the right. And I actually think it matters. And so when, when people like me and Professor Tushnet and Eugene Volek get involved, uh, we start to see some better outcomes as we saw last week in the, the de Havilland reversal um, and a recognizing of the speech interest. We've increasingly in New York, which is trying to pass new right of publicity legislation, which it's never had. It's only had this right of privacy, which is very much uh, its right of publicity. But they're now trying to pass a new right of publicity law that would uh, er eradicate its several hundred years of, of privacy law and, and replace it with a freely transferable right. And previously, no one other than SAG and the Motion Picture Association were in the room talking about the law. And through uh, getting involved, we've now been able to meet with some of the legislatures. I don't know that we'll be able to stop the train of New York passing this law, um, but we may be able to make it a little better and, and certainly shed light on it and are making sure that they're hearing from other people, members of the public, video game makers, uh, journalists, so they're at least hearing more than just in a back room, the Screen Actors Guild and the Motion Picture Association drafting a law that they, those two parties, are happy with. get together and get to the table and not have to sign away their rights in perpetuity to their images. I've been aware in cases one of those pieces that come up as well. Do you see collective action and collective bargaining as part of the solution to your problem? 
Yes, that's one thing, and, and people being more aware of this, and, and hopefully everyone who leaves here will look at all those contracts that you sign uh, in which you're assigning rights to your name and likeness and your children's name and likeness. Um, and collective bargaining can be a place where your entity, whether it's the Screen Actors Guild or Student uh, Athlete Association or Players Association, negotiates it. And professional ball players um, do have their Players Association negotiate their image rights in a way that student athletes don't. Um, so I think that's very concerning. I think some of the unfortunate decisions about the First Amendment um, arose out of the student athlete cases in part because the student athletes were so poorly treated that the court wanted to be helpful, but in doing so made, I think, a, a, a very wrong headed decision in terms of free speech grounds, in terms of preventing the description and depiction of historical games and rosters. So I'm not sure that, that, that this is the best space for solving that problem of the inequities in, in you know, college athletics, which, which truly are quite inequitable to the players. In other states, such as New York, it's not the central and it's extinguished death. I'm just uh, wondering about your view as to the degree to which public policy should enable the disability to provide publicity in any conditions that should be attached to them. So I thought a lot about postmortem rights as well, and that's something that, that I talk about in more depth in the, in the book. Uh, I mentioned it here a little, but I didn't talk necessarily about my views. I, I think that the postmortem, I'm not convinced that we should be giving a windfall to unrelated corporations to make money off of dead people. Um, that's not something that I support. Uh, and I think there's some, some very problematic examples. And I think we'll probably see more of them uh, if, if it continues to be descendable, if people approaching older celebrities who don't necessarily have personal heirs to try to, to sort of wrest control of their, their after-death rights. On the other hand, I am somewhat sympathetic to uh, relatives and, and close family members not wanting to see crass merchandising of their deceased loved one in the aftermath. And so I think some more limited time period, limited to natural persons, uh, and uh, where there's been an affirmative plan by the deceased to, to perhaps bar commercialization. Robin Williams did this in terms of barring commercialization of his own identity for 25 years after death. And um, part of that was also to avoid estate taxes. One of the problems now is that the law is set up to make the CMGs of the world wealthy off the dead, but the actual close family heirs may have to commercialize their deceased one just to pay off the tax bill because the IRS will value the estate at its highest and best purpose, which it deems to be commercialized. So the Michael Jackson estate, for example, is involved in litigation with the IRS and their uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars apart in how much his right of publicity is worth, which greatly alters the tax bill. Now, they plan to commercialize him, but you can imagine if you didn't want to, if your goal was not to commercialize your loved one, that would be a real problem. So I think that all the, the sort of way in which the postmortem right is currently constructed is the exact opposite of how we would want such a right designed. Registration with the Secretary of State or something while the person is alive. It tends to apply to celebrities and normally is part of that sort of yeah, it doesn't actually, uh, the California law is not limited to celebrities, and while it does have a registration provision, it's not required to be done before death. So you can transfer it while you're alive, but you don't have to. Um, but yeah, there, I, and I don't think California has a model post-mortem law, to be clear. Um, I, 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 I would design it quite differently. Um, over here. I'm very much interested in, um, you haven't mentioned the public domain and what happens when um, the right of publicity uh, conflicts with that and uh, which one should win out at that point? 
So that's, that's also something I, I talk about, uh, particularly with regard to copyright and the chapter on copyright, which is that currently, because of how robust the right of publicity is and how it's being evaluated sort of on par with copyright, that it could potentially undo the public domain that copyright law provides, and, and that is very concerning. So I, I think that the right of publicity cannot be an end run around that, and that copyright law itself should serve to preempt right of publicity claims in context where copyright law expressly places something in the public domain, whether the copyright has expired, or if someone is, uh, for example, buys a poster with a movie star in it and then wants to put it up, that that's something that I think that copyright law expressly allows, similar with sound alikes. Um, so I, I, that's definitely something that I advocate. Using certain like names and likeness of people, like even if it's not uh, very famous people. So, in this sense, that do you think it will forbid certain transformative work or other commercials to use people's names or images to build innovations, like a very funny kind of a joke on the you know, YouTube or? Yes, yeah, so I, one of the, the concerns that I have is this shutting down of free speech, including sort of imaginative commentary um, about, uh, particularly about public figures. Um, and, and so when we think about the right of publicity, I'm not saying we should, I'm quite the opposite. I'm saying we should have a better balance between free speech and the right of publicity. I'm just saying I don't think we should get rid of the right of publicity. I think it has some value and can be sort of resurrected um, and reimagined in a way that's more harmonious to our original instincts with privacy laws. Um, but but I, I wouldn't want it to shut down sort of transformative or paradic uses. Um, now, the transformative, the term transformativeness is imported from copyright law. And some courts have used it in right of publicity cases. It's pretty muddy in terms of what it means. And in part, the Olivia de Havilland decision and the, I think the misstep by the trial court there was driven by sort of misunderstanding transformation as needing to transform the underlying person's actual image rather than putting it in a transformative new context such as a biographical picture. So that term itself can be somewhat problematic. So I don't necessarily uh, support adopting the transformativeness test in the right of publicity. I think there, there are better ways to analyze it than that. Uh, one, uh, one of my excellent students, and uh, I think this question may in part have been motivated by something we discussed, um, and uh, unfortunately I can't put it up on the screen, but uh, there's a series of interesting ads um, uh, for a startup called Upwork. Can you hold the microphone? Oh, sorry. A series of ads for a startup called Upwork, um, and uh, they include, hey, Amazon, need any help with literally anything in the world? And so it's like a freelancer startup. And, you know, hey, Blockbuster, oh, never mind. Uh, and, hey, George R. R. Martin, need a ghostwriter to finish that saga, call us. Um, so these are things, all of which are you know, not confusing. There's no question of a false endorsement. And uh, I, I wonder to what extent you think there's an interest in stopping that, um, because it is commercial. And it's also clear that Amazon, for example, would lose a trademark infringement case. It's a nominative fair use. So is there a personal interest that changes such that, you know, does, does George R. R. Martin have an interest in not being commercialized um, in this particular way that's distinct from Amazon's interest, which we don't honor? So I haven't seen uh, the ads, uh, so maybe I, I, will, I will look at them afterwards. So I, it's difficult for me to comment uh, without having seen them. Um, but I do think that, uh, that 
I'm troubled if Amazon can take individuals' names and likenesses without their permission and then retool them as advertisements. So I think there is an interest in, in stopping that. And uh, as I contend in the book, I'm much more concerned about private figures being used without permission because private figures do not necessarily need to be used um, to tell the story. So it's very different if you're telling a story about the feud between Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and Olivia de Havilland is one of Betty Davis's best friends and involved there. You want to talk about Olivia de Havilland. You can't talk about Jane Smith. You have to talk about Olivia de Havilland. But if you're talking about an individual, uh, just who who's, could be anyone, and you're using their story, as was true in the Hurt Locker litigation that some of you may be familiar with, in which um, that was an Academy Award-winning film, and, and the main character was based on a real person, and he sued. But the film had changed the person's name, didn't use his actual image. And so in that instance, they didn't have to use the name of the real person, in that instance, Jeffrey Sarver, to tell their story. Because it didn't really matter whether it was Jeffrey Sarver or you know, John Watts. It didn't matter for their story. And so they didn't have to use the person's actual name and actual likeness to tell the story just as well. And I, I think that's an important distinction. Wait, so, uh, so just to be clear, so you think that if they had used his name, there would have been a valid claim in the Hurt Locker case? Um, I think that there probably still would have been a First Amendment defense in that instance to the real story. I'm just saying that I think that the claim was that, and, and some of this goes to how the Ninth Circuit evaluated the Hurt Locker litigation in which they said that a public figure would have had a claim there, but he didn't because he was a private figure, which seems, in my mind, exactly backwards. So that's, that's where, where my point is. I think that there's a stronger First Amendment argument to using Olivia de Havilland, because she's not replaceable, than there is uh, for using Jeffrey Sarver when you could have renamed him Will James, which is, is what they did. That doesn't mean if they'd used Jeffrey Sarver and accurately depicted him in a non-defamatory way uh, that, that it shouldn't have been uh, protected by the First Amendment. So the qualifications you added actually just uh, go to the heart of where we disagree, I think, right? So suddenly it's accurately depicted instead of, um, you know, non-defamatorily depicted, which yes. I think is actually a pretty big difference. Well, I, mean, I mean... litigation on a regular yes, basis. Yes, yes. I mean non-defamatory, and I said accurately depicted in a non-defamatory way. So there's, there needs to be breathing room for not getting it exactly right. Uh, which I think defamation law and false light law and the First Amendment protections associated with that right. do. So I wasn't I wasn't trying right. to suggest. Well, uh, so uh, so let me let me uh, talk about the other thing. Uh, so um, I asked about an ad invoking George R. R. Martin's notable lateness, um, which you know TV anchors and you know everybody else in the public sphere is allowed to do. Um, it's sort of odd that advertisers currently aren't, but it is. Interesting to me that you immediately jump to a movie, right? So part of our disagreement here is you don't believe in a commercial, non-commercial speech distinction, uh, and I do. And I, uh, to me, uh, that deeply complicates this issue because whatever rights you hand out for commercial advertisers and Facebook end up extending in your model to movie producers. Can you speak a little to that? Yes. So. That is a, a dispute that we have in many spheres, uh, not just in, in the context of the right of publicity. And some of that is, um, uh, has to do with just pragmatism in terms of, I think, the current Supreme Court has largely eliminated the divisions between commercial speech and non-commercial speech for First Amendment purposes. So I'm not sure that it has that much uh, continued uh, villains, but I also think it's problematic to be used outside of advertising your name and likeness as well without your permission. Now, I think that the balance shifts. So uh, why you need to use the person in advertising may be much less compelling than why you would need to use the person to tell a story about the golden age of Hollywood. So it's not that I think that they're equivalent, it's that I think that there's also an interest even in the non-commercial context. And so if we talk about revenge porn, that's in the non-commercial context, but I still think it's very problematic. And so I do not think that these laws necessarily should be limited only to commercial speech, uh, but uh, I wouldn't shed tears either if they were limited uh, to advertising and commercial speech as a way to limit some of the, the damage to free speech. And, and certainly in the post-mortem context, I think it's very important to have much more robust express exemptions in the laws for movies and books and the like. 